So I think I've cracked the code on this camera. The key to understanding the Canon R5C is to know that it is not a cinema and stills camera. It's a cinema camera and it is also a stills camera. Let me explain. On paper, this is the perfect camera. It's a Canon R5 as far as stills go with 45 megapixels, an RF mount, etc. And then, with the flip of a switch, it transforms into a pro video camera with a pro video interface and a menu system capable of recording up to 8K full frame raw footage. But I think the hybrid nature of the R5C could suggest a misunderstanding of its strengths, even though it is undeniably great at taking stills and capturing incredible footage. When I bought this thing, I imagined it would be a phenomenal run and gun, do it all camera. And that makes sense, right? Take this one camera body to a job, grab some stills, grab some video, and you're good. And I did use it for exactly that, and it performed well. So if I could only buy one camera, the R5C would probably be the one that I went with. But here's the thing, I already own a C70. And since owning both cameras, the C70 gets way more use than my R5C. That's for one simple reason. The C70 is grab and go. Plug in a shotgun mic and I've got a pro video camera right away, perfect for nimble documentary work, which is often the kind of thing that I am filming. Even though it can't take stills like the R5C, has half the max resolution of the R5C, and has a smaller sensor than the R5C, the C70 has been my go-to camera for every single job this year. And admittedly, this could be because of the kinds of jobs that I've been on lately, and that's obviously gonna be different for everyone. I've done a lot of run and gun event coverage this year. You might have seen the videos that I published about the strike and contract campaign OPEIU Local 39 has been involved in up in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm just not going to rig out the R5C with the Tascam XLR module, variable ND solution, and external battery to carry with me on the picket line. I ended up using it as a stills camera while recording interviews in B-roll with the C70 though, and it was great for photos. One of the biggest reasons the R5C just won't ever be my go-to for nimble documentary work is because of its battery life. This thing devours batteries. Since the latest firmware update version 1.0.5.1, this has improved, but if you're gonna use the camera for video, you'd better have an alternative power solution. In a previous video, I talked about how I used this external battery from Core SWX, and uh, it worked pretty well for a while, but occasionally it would just make a loud whining noise. Sometimes it just wouldn't turn on even though it had been charging for hours. And those two factors were more than enough for me to decide that I didn't want to trust this battery anymore. I'm not trying to fry my R5C. So I turned to two other Canon approved options. For long tripod setups, I just use a USB battery bank rated for power delivery like this one from Tether Tools. And when I need to be more mobile, I use the battery grip that Canon sells for this camera. The grip contains two LPE6 batteries and while the runtime still isn't fantastic, it's reasonable enough now. I could show up to set with four fully charged Canon batteries and be confident that I'll be good for the day with only one battery swap. And even just as a stills camera, I wouldn't consider the R5C to be terribly nimble either. Don't get me wrong, it takes amazing photos and I love shooting with it. It's just a physically large device. If my assignment was just to capture high quality professional stills, I would grab this without a second's hesitation. But when I'm shooting video first, still second, as I almost always am, I have a much smaller and lighter camera that I'm gonna grab first. That's the Fujifilm X100V. The world does not need another YouTube video about the X100V, but let me just say it's probably my favorite camera I've ever used. And obviously that's apples and oranges, right? The Fujifilm and the Canon are just completely different styles of cameras. They're not checking the same box. I'm just saying that when I'm running around filming video and wanna get some stills on the side, I'm gonna take the small and light Fujifilm rather than the really big, bulky Canon. And while we're still talking about photos, the R5C's autofocus is amazing while in photo mode. Basically, as a pro stills camera, I have zero complaints. I'm nowhere near the skill level as a photographer for where the technical limitations of this camera will ever hold me back. This is overkill for basically every photo I've ever taken. 
But when you switch into video mode on the R5C, the autofocus takes a huge hit. I'm not sure what the deal is there. For the longest time before the latest firmware update this summer, the autofocus was straight up kind of bad. I would need to babysit it just to make sure subjects were in focus. And coming from the Sony world, this was honestly really disappointing. The autofocus on modern Sony cameras is absolutely reliable enough to trust for the kind of dock work that I do, and probably the feature that I miss the most with my switch to Canon video cameras. Since the 1.0.5.1 firmware update though, the autofocus on the R5C has improved a lot. It's not quite yet at Sony levels still, but I'm no longer losing important shots because of missed focus. I would love for it to actually get to Sony levels, but we're still not there. Where this camera shines though, is as a cinema camera. In fact, this could easily be considered a better A camera than the C70 because of the higher max resolution and full frame coverage. You could set up the R5C as the main wide camera in an interview at 8K and roll the C70 for coverage. Just be sure to have a good power solution. And you should be recording sound separately anyway at this point. So the C70's built-in mini XLR ports aren't that much of a killer feature when being nimble isn't as much of a priority. One possible major caveat to the R5C's cinema bona fides is its lack of C-Log2. That seems to be a deal breaker for some people, and I get it. It's the better log profile. There's no reason Canon doesn't include it for the R5C. But I'm not a C-Log3 hater. I know it technically has less dynamic range than C-Log2, but it definitely has enough range for my needs. Maybe someday I'll look back on this video and eat my words, but the obsession over dynamic range to the exclusion to, or to the emphasis over all other factors, just doesn't make sense to me. I'm just never in a situation where the extra fraction of a stop is make or break for me. If you can't light it better on set, then you've got bigger problems to worry about and that extra bit of reach doesn't matter that much anyway. I'm not making excuses for Canon here. I would prefer if the R5C had C-Log2, and it should have C-Log2. I'm just saying that I shoot in C-Log3 on both the R5C and the C70, and it's totally fine. In a weird way, it's almost like the R5C is too good at photos and too good at video. When I need the highest quality stills I can get and I don't care about the bulk, I reach the R5C. When I need the highest resolution full frame footage I can get and I don't mind rigging it out, I reach for the R5C. But when I just need great video or great stills on the go, I'm gonna reach for other cameras first, even when that means carrying around two cameras instead of one. So do I regret buying this camera or would I steer people away from it? Not at all. It took me a while to figure it out, but now this slots perfectly into my workflow when I need two camera angles for an interview. And if I need to take some photos, I have more than enough firepower there as well. So that's my sort of long-term review on the Canon R5C with the latest firmware update, having used it for about a year and a half now. Thanks for watching. <laughs>